A very good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion with Restart Sri Lanka 2023. The theme for today is outlook and challenges for a post-debt restructure economy. We will start with a discussion with our two panelists for 30 minutes, followed by an audience Q&A session for 15 minutes. For this session, we have two very esteemed panelists and former central bank governors. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce first, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. No stranger at all to Sri Lankan economic sphere, Dr. Kumaraswamy served as the 14th governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka between 2016 and 2019. He completed his university education with a BA honors degree from the University of Cambridge and went on to obtain his PhD in economics from the University of Sussex. Dr. Kumar Swami served in several senior positions at the Central Bank, the Ministry of Finance, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Our second panelist, Dr. Reza Bakir, is a former governor of the State Bank of Pakistan and holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley and an AB magna cum laude in economics from Harvard University. Dr. Bakir is currently a managing director with Alvarez and Marcel and global practice leader of a and Sovereign Advisory Services in Dubai. He accounts for more than 25 years of experience in global sovereign work and has held several senior positions at the IMF. Without further ado, let's start our discussion. We'll go now to the panelists for opening statements. Uh, Dr. Kumar Swami, if I may start with you, what do you think of the progress made so far by Sri Lanka in navigating its way out of this economic crisis? And if you could comment on what your outlook is for the country. Hello, hi. Um, good afternoon to everybody in Colombo and uh, probably good morning to others uh, who are in Europe and um, the US. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Capital Alliance for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, and my um, appreciation goes out to Ajit Fernando and, and his team, uh, particularly Yu Sanura, uh, for making the arrangements for, for me to participate. I'm particularly privileged to participate on a panel with Dr. Reza Bakir, the former governor of the Pakistan National Bank and an extremely eminent economist for the first at the IMF. And now, of course, he's with um, Marsal and Alvarez, um, uh, Alvarez and Marsal, which, which is actually doing some work in Sri Lanka now. I'm sure he'll tell us about it. Anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I listened to the governor's excellent uh, presentation to this forum uh, earlier today. Uh, I thought it was comprehensive and extremely credible. Um, but it pre presented a bit of a challenge because uh, he covered ground uh, which I was thinking of covering in my presentation, but he has done it so comprehensively and so well, there is nothing to be gained by me um, traversing the same ground. So I'm going to change tack a little bit. What I'm going to do is first um, give some uh, commentary on how I think macroeconomic policy formulation has been strengthened, then talk a little bit about some structural reforms and identify a few risks which may threaten the upside scenario uh, that is now before us. There is clearly a path for, for recovery and sustained growth, and the governor's remarks confirm that. However, there are also some risks we need to keep in mind. So what, what are, why do I say that the framework for macro, macroeconomic policymaking has been significantly improved? Now, uh, those of you from Sri Lanka would probably now uh, be uh, sick of he hearing me bleating on about how uh, macroeconomic stress has been the main cause of Sri Lanka's underperformance since independence. Well, now we have actually done a few things which created frameworks which will enable us to do better going forward. So what are they? Now, the new Central Bank Act has some measures which will make it much more difficult to have the kind of fiscal forbearance we've had uh, in our monetary policy formulation in the past. The two main channels for fiscal forbearance, one was central bank deficit financing, and the second was financial repression, whereby interest rates were kept artificially low. And both these measures uh, serve to increase excess aggregate demand and then put pressure on both prices as well as the balance of payments. So now what's happened? Well, the uh, the new CBSL Act makes it extremely difficult for the central bank to undertake the most invidious form of 
deficit financing. Um, um, that is purchasing uh, the government's paper, purchasing treasury bills in the primary auction. That has been made much more difficult and the new act specifies very special circumstances, exceptional circumstances, like say the pandemic, where the central bank can assist the government by participating in the primary auction. And even that has to be passed by parliament now. So that channel of fiscal forbearance, which has undermined uh, monetary policy and also macroeconomic stability as a whole by creating excess aggregate demand, which is fed into inflation and has fed into a balance of payments crisis um, through fueling uh, you know, excess aggregate demand. That channel has been made much more difficult uh, in terms of creating instability in the system. The second thing is financial repression. That was the other source of fiscal forbearance. Basically, interest rates were kept below uh, positive real rates um, artificially. Uh, in order to provide cheap money for the government. Uh, well, now the new um, central bank bill uh, has flexible inflation targeting uh, as the framework for monetary policy formulation and under flexible uh, inflation targeting, uh, you know, inflation is the target and you have a data-driven forward-looking monetary policy regime in place. So under such a regime, which is data-driven and forward-looking, you cannot really have financial repression of the type we've had in the past, whereby artificially uh, interest rates were kept down with various interest rate caps for treasury bills, et cetera. So both those sources of, uh, of, of uh, fiscal uh, forbearance in monetary policy have been made much more difficult uh, to indulge in going forward, which I think is a major advance in terms of having uh, more stable macroeconomic outcomes. On the exchange rate, under the uh, you know, flexible inflation targeting regime, the exchange rate uh, is used as the first line of defense against external shock, shocks. So it has to be managed flexibly. In the past, as you know, we have tried to defend a, a, a specific rate on more than one occasion, and this has led to large-scale depletion of reserves. We've done it more than once, time and again, but now under a flexible inflation targeting regime, it's inflation that is targeted and the exchange rate is managed flexibly uh, so that uh, you don't have this kind of depletion of, of reserves uh, by trying to maintain a fixed rate. I mean, it, it avoids the uh, impossible trinity of which uh, economists would know about. Then the... Um, on the on the uh, uh, as far as businesses are con concerned, I mean, businesses in Sri Lanka have got used to a fixed exchange rate being provided by the central bank, and despite the the impact on on reserves, this has had time and again. Well, in future, they will have to use market based instruments to pre create greater certainty uh, through uh, forward booking, through swaps, through options, etc. So various instruments that are available in the market. I need to be used more for there to be a greater stability in terms of the, the exchange rate that businesses operate with. So on the fiscal side, uh, um, you know, uh, revenue has already been enhanced. There have been several fiscal measures that have been announced. Uh, so I won't go through all that, uh, but there is a further widening of the tax base anticipated through new taxes uh, on wealth and wealth transfers. Um, and and um, there's a concerted effort being made to uh, improve tax administration. Tax administration, as everybody knows, is very poor. The IRD, the customs, the excise department all have a considerable room for improvement in terms of their capacity to, to uh, collect revenue. And there is now a move to have a revenue authority where these three revenue uh, agencies are combined into one. Uh, so that process is also uh, underway and um, the digitalization. I, I saw, I read somewhere, I think that Francis Maud, who uh, led digitalization in the UK, is, is going to be coming to Sri Lanka to try to uh, assist us in getting uh, uh, digitalization further along um, the way to help us uh, with, our, uh, uh, with our strengthening of the tax administration. 
There's also an independent debt office that's being created. This is a very important initiative as far as the central bank is concerned, because there was a inbuilt conflict of interest in the operations of the central bank uh, between its role as the being responsible for monetary policy formulation on the one hand and monetary policy formulation to stabilize prices on the one hand and its agency role uh, as an agent for the government in debt management where it was expected to raise money cheaply as possible for the government these were clearly contradictory and now with an independent debt office that conflict is likely to be removed on the structural reforms uh, here perhaps things are not moving as quickly as possible but there are several fronts on which uh, progress is being made uh, i think uh, dr bakir is involved uh, in one of the major transactions there have been seven entities that have been identified for divestment in the first phase uh, and that process is moving forward N not as quickly as i think one would like but clearly if there is an effective soe reform program uh, there'd be very positive impact uh, that would be felt on not on productivity uh, on uh, 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 raising uh, fx proceeds through the divestment uh, transactions uh, and also in terms of uh, long-term fiscal stability so as the soe program is critical uh, it is underway um, ideally it should move it faster and i think there uh, we need to use the whatever political capital is necessary uh, to give tailwind to this process uh, then um, the other things that need to be done and which are under consideration and i think action is being taken but again we need to move faster our factor market reforms um, improving the investment climate and investment promotion trade policy here uh, there are negotiations to uh, convert the indian fta into a, a, a part economic partnership agreement under the etca uh, negotiations of for an fta with china are ongoing as well as with thailand so these need to be pushed forward uh, the revitalization of the Singapore FTA is a good thing. It gives us opportunities and it will give us opportunities in terms of investment, as well as using the Singapore FTA to penetrate uh, the ASEAN market, particularly uh, in the area of e-commerce. Um, and uh, the president has declared the intention of Sri Lanka to join ASEP. Um, ASEP includes ASEAN, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. So it's a massive, great organization. I don't think this is something we'll be able to do very quickly because I think the kind of reforms we would need to introduce to be able to join ASEP will be quite challenging. But it's a good aspiration to have and it's a good signal to give uh, to say that we are keen on uh, joining ASEP. Um, then uh, on India, the relationship with India, you know, in terms of the future prospects of the economy. I think a strong um, tailwind to the growth process in Sri Lanka can be obtained by increasing our connectivity with the Indian economy. Um, now there are plans, I think, for grid connectivity, for strengthening air and sea connectivity, and even a land bridge is under consideration. So, you know, for years and years, we've had proximity obviously forever we've had proximity to India but the very poor infrastructure in both countries uh, has meant that transaction costs of cross-border uh, 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 economic activity has been very high uh, in addition India had an inward looking strategy for a long time but now it has a its neighborhood first policy it has its uh, uh, make in India policy all that will create new opportunities for countries in the region and the transaction costs are coming down with improvements in roads, um, uh, railways, uh, airports, etc., in both countries. So the prospect for really uh, piggybacking onto the Indian story has been increased and we should make a, a, a concerted effort to do so. The other point that I'd like to make uh, re relates to um, addressing corruption vulnerabilities. This is something that is a, now a pillar of the IMF program, the EFF. This is something that is new. I don't think we've ever had it before. Certainly, we haven't had it before. Um, uh, I don't know whether other countries have, but certainly this is there as a as a, uh, one of the key pillars of the EFF. And uh, the uh, the Anti-Corruption Act has been passed by Parliament. Of course, 
laws mean nothing unless they are implemented effectively. So it is to be seen whether we implement the Anti-Corruption Act, which is better aligned with the UN Convention on Corruption, whether this law is implemented. The other thing on this, uh, on the anti-corruption front, is that the IMF diagnostic um, on addressing corruption vulnerabilities has just about been finalized. It should be shared with the government during the course of this month. And really, whether or not the government is serious about addressing corruption vulnerabilities will be demonstrated by how it treats the recommendations of this diagnostic study. It will be a good litmus test for the government's attitude to addressing corruption vulnerability. Because the undertaking has been given by the government that the recommendations of the IMF diagnostic would be incorporated into the EFF program going forward and implemented by the government. How much of that goes forward uh, is something that will give us an indication of how serious the authorities are in terms of addressing, uh, uh, addressing corruption. It's the social safety net. You know, this is a big lesson that we need to learn, I think, from what has happened in the last year or 18 months. Um, you know, I, lots of reports are coming out regarding the how much poverty has deteriorated, how much vulnerability has uh, increased, uh, how much uh, child nutrition has suffered. There are so many more and more indicators coming out on what has been happening. Now, people blame the IMF program. But I think that when people who do that fail to take into account that the country was in a very big hole before the IMF came, we had massive shortages of all the essentials. We had long queues and very, very severe problems. And, and the, the dollar and uh, uh, LKR illiquidity that was there at the time, which was causing all these problems, have been addressed to a significant extent because of the IMF program. So you can't blame the IMF program for all these problems. These problems were there because of the hole we had fallen into. And that hole was caused by various things, uh, which everybody knows. So I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, and so the social, you know, when you have as big an adjustment as we have to make, I mean, the hole is as big as the one that confronts us, there is a strong case for strengthening the social safety net up front. I know the ASPSMA is now beginning to be rolled out, but I think it would have been ideal if the, uh, the ASPSMA or, or whatever means um, that was going to be used to strengthen the social safety net and to target it better, if this was done right up front, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have done away with the, uh, uh, the, the, the deterioration in poverty and the increase in vulnerability, but at least could have mitigated it to a significant extent. Finally, I'm going to run through some quick risks. You know, the, the, listening to the governor's uh, remarks this morning and very credible remarks in my view, uh, I was struck by the upside scenario uh, that is very possible for the country. There is a path ahead to restore uh, uh, growth and, 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 and sustain it in the medium to long term. And also to have, as the governor pointed out, a higher growth than the 3% that's been built into the debt sustainability uh, targets. So the, what are the risks? Climate risks. The World Bank has identified Sri Lanka as a vulnerable country on climate. So we need to make sure that we uh, are alert to the risks that come out through drought or through floods. Uh, there was some talk that we, the Maha season might be affected by drought, but that seems to have receded now. Uh, but we are in the midst of an El Nino episode, so we need to be alert and uh, proactive uh, in terms of planning for uh, the, the impacts of, of, of climate change, of, of the droughts uh, or floods, as the case may be. Then elevated geographic, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, tensions, that is something that we'll have to live with. The world has become a more tense place, and, and that will have an impact on global supply chains and commodity prices. Again, we need to be proactive and factor all that in and see how best to have contingency plans to cope with the impacts of uh, elevated uh, geopolitical uh, uh, risks. And we need to have a very transparent and uh, uh, prudent uh, external relations policy, uh, which maintain Sri Lanka's good relations with all the major players in the world. The biggest risk, and I, I please, this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say. Uh, you know, for years I said we were we could become another Greece. Nobody really listened, and we ended up there. 
let me say this again. I hope people will be more attentive than they were in the last time I alerted people to a possible uh, serious uh, uh, crisis. The election calendar. Every single time there has been an election, Sri Lanka's macroeconomic policies have become um, indisciplined. We've had 16 IMF programs before the current one. On each of those, on many of them, we did make progress on stabilization, as we have done on this one. But as soon as an election approached, the progress that was made was reversed. We are supposed to be having elections next year. I hope we don't have the same thing again. We must not allow the gains that we've made to be reversed through policy slippage. And on structural reforms, we have never done well, simply because you know the, the, there are winners and losers. And though the losers are fewer in number, they their voices tend to be louder. And we haven't had the political will to go through with these structural reforms. Now, unless we do differently this time, we will not be able to get out, get into a sustained recovery. So it's crucial that the structural reforms are also pursued vigorously. And one thing I must say is this time around, if we allow election, uh, elections to distract us from the path of stabilization and recovery and then sustain growth, the crisis that will hit us will be worse than anything that we've had in the past. It will be worse than what we had some 18 months ago. So we should remember that. We need to change the mold whereby economics is not undermined seriously by the, uh, the electoral calendar. That has to change. If it doesn't, we will lose what we have gained so far and the consequences will be far worse than we've ever experienced in the past. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've overrun. Thank you, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Um, if I can go to Dr. Bakir now, uh, sorry, before that audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A uh, function on Zoom to direct your questions. Uh, Dr. Bakir, if I may now come to you, given your global experience on sovereign restructurings, uh, could you elaborate on how Sri Lanka compares to some of the restructurings you have been a part of? Thank you, Senator, first of all, for the invitation. I have uh, just tried to start my video, but I think it says the host has to do it. So um, I can try again. And if otherwise, there you go. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I want to also appreciate and compliment Dr. Indrajit on his very incisive comments, as well as I want to compliment the governor on his uh, remarks this morning, which I thought, like Dr. Indrajit, were very, very well received and very insightful. So the topic for today's session is outlook and challenges for a post debt restructure economy. And so I thought I could make a couple of points. The first is about maybe the some of the upsides and the pitfalls of life after debt restructuring. Um, and then if you like, I can make some comments regarding the state-owned enterprise reform agenda now or later in the Q&A, how you may uh, think it is better. So let me begin with uh, some of the upsides and the pitfalls of life after restructuring. And uh, I'm gonna share my thoughts and I just want to preface by laying out the perspective from which I share my thoughts. And these are three. The first perspective is um, from 20 years of experience at the IMF when I used to go to countries and would um, offer advice to countries and four of those years as the head of the debt policy division of the IMF. The second perspective being that of a central bank governor of a high debt country, that is Pakistan, when suddenly I was on the other end of uh, receiving the advice and also thinking how to manage such situations. And the third perspective is now leading a sovereign advisory practice and engaging in conversations with a number of countries around the world that are facing debt distress challenges. Now, when we get into this issue of uh, life after debt restructuring, and before I share my thoughts, I also want to make one other point, and that is a point from experience, which is that, you know, debt restructurings are very hard and they're very difficult. And for the policymakers, they're operating under very difficult circumstances. So, I just want to make a plug at the very 
beginning that it is also good to appreciate the work being done by the policymakers of the country that are in the midst of a debt restructuring. This means the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, the state-owned enterprise reform unit, others who are all working together. Many of them typically in debt restructurings have also been brought in because a crisis has occurred. Um, there is a need for bringing people in. When such people come in, a lot of the damage is already done. So they've been dealt a hand where, you know, it's already a bad hand to begin with. So I think it's important to take a moment to appreciate the work that is done by the policymakers in these challenging circumstances. So um, let me then talk a little bit about uh, what is life like after a restructuring, what are some of the upsides and what are some of the pitfalls. And um, I want to uh, you know, talk at a general level from the literature and there is very good work done, including by Professor Carmen Reinhardt at Harvard and uh, Christoph Trebisch, uh, two leading authors um, on the work on debt restructuring, but also many others. And the first point that I want to make, um, and they uh, note this, is that generally, if you look for countries that have gone through a debt restructuring, there are good grounds to be optimistic about what happens to growth, and naturally also what happens uh, about debt. Now, um, on growth, let's just take uh, the you know, uh, economic growth. One study finds that a 10% NPV reduction in debt after a debt restructuring can lead to a 1.2% increase in growth in the year following the restructuring. So these are good dividends that a debt restructuring gives. Similarly, on debt, um, the study by Professors Carmen Reinhardt and Professor Trebesh shows that in the year before debt restructuring, typically in an emerging market, the debt to GDP level is around 80% of GDP. And then three years after the debt restructuring, the debt to GDP level on average is around 53% of GDP. So nearly a little more than 25 percentage points of GDP less, which are all very good dividends that a debt restructuring uh, gives. So, you know, not surprisingly, perhaps, once a country has gone through a debt restructuring, there are reasons to be optimistic about what is the course for growth and what is the course for debt, what is the course for gross financing needs, and more generally, what is the course for macroeconomic developments in the country after restructuring? So that is some of the upside. But then there are some pitfalls and um, or caveats. The first caveat is uh, what Professor Reinhardt and Trebesh note themselves in their study, which is that, and I'm quoting here, when, that they say that the economic landscape of data countries improves significantly after debt relief operations, but only if these involve debt write-offs. They note the softer forms of debt relief, such as maturity extensions and interest rate reductions are not generally followed by higher economic growth or improved credit ratings. Now, what is important to note is that, and I think if the point would resonate, that debt reductions where there are uh, significant NPV reductions, net present value reductions. These are the types that deliver, these are the types that are more likely to deliver the upside in terms of growth and in terms of uh, reduction in debt. A significant maturity extension, a reduction in coupon, uh, other forms of uh, a debt restructuring, even if they don't write down the principle, they can deliver significant NPV reduction. And um, it is, um, you know, there is a world before a debt restructuring and the world when you're in a debt restructuring. Ex ante, typically countries do not want to get into a debt restructuring. Nobody wants to be the finance minister of a country and have to go to creditors and ask for relief. But that's ex ante. Once a default has already occurred, then it is in the interest of the debtor country to get as much of a NPV reduction as possible from the creditors so that it sets itself up 
for realizing these benefits in terms of growth and in terms of reduction in the debt to GDP ratio. So that's one caveat that the literature finds. Another point that I want to mention is at a broader level, which is that typically the benefits of a debt restructuring in terms of its macro impact begin to flatten out four or five years after the debt restructuring. And it is important to then ask the question in Sri Lanka, for instance, five years after this debt restructuring, what needs to be done today to ensure or to improve the chances that debt does not begin to grow again? Because four or five years from now, whatever happened in this debt restructuring is no, gonna, no longer going to be consequential for what happens to the path of debt afterwards. And here comes, I think, a much bigger point, which is that if, and this is a general point, countries after a debt restructuring address successfully those factors that led to a default in the first place, then there are good grounds to expect that there will not be a need for another debt restructuring. But there are also examples of countries that have had repeated restructuring. So the point I would make out here now is that it is important to think about what needs to be done now, and Dr. Indrajit referred to this as well, particularly in terms of structural fiscal reforms, as well as others, to lay the foundations that after a few years of this debt restructuring, debt does not begin to grow again. In summary, the point I'm trying to make is to not let a crisis go to waste and conditional upon already being in a debt restructuring to lay the foundations for how the recovery from that debt restructuring can be sustained. And number two, to avoid the fate and the future that will really manifest itself several years from now, to avoid the fate of those countries that have had to come back for a debt restructuring. It has happened once. Let's try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So those were some thoughts, Sanura, I had wanted to share on uh, life after debt restructurings and also some of the pitfalls to avoid. A second point that uh, you had asked me to speak a little bit about was on state-owned enterprises. So I'll try to make an overarching comment quickly and then happy to take some questions. First point that I wanted to make is uh, Sri Lanka has a comprehensive reform program on the state-owned enterprise sector. Sri Lanka is not alone. There are many countries right now which are facing economic stress and also have the need for economic reform programs on the SOE sector. When you begin to think about these issues, you know, there is, first of all, a broader question about what is the right size of the government in a country? And if you look at Western countries, for instance, just as a point of reference, you will find the complete spectrum. And this question is very closely also tied to a political question of left versus right leaning, uh, state systems or governments. In some countries, you'll find that the state performs a number of social and other services. And in other countries, you'll find a very, very private sector driven approach. So the, as a point of departure, what I'm saying is that in general, if you look around the world, you will find examples of all types in terms of the role of the state in the provision of some economic resources. The point I want to make is that for developing countries or emerging markets that have a debt and a foreign exchange problem, their choices are constrained. They are perhaps not at the same luxury of choosing whatever system that other countries may be able to choose. And there are reasons for this. First is that in such countries, state-owned enterprises have often contributed to the debt and deficits problem. So if they have, and that sector and those problems in the SOE sector are not effectively dealt with, then no matter what the Ministry of Finance may do or what the central bank may do, a few years after the debt restructuring, the deficits emanating from 
the state-owned enterprise sector may lead to a resurgence and a rebuild up of debt. So that's point number one, why the choice is more constrained for developing countries. Point number two is that many state-owned enterprises uh, undermine productivity. And the point I want to make here is that some SOEs may be profitable, but they may not be as efficient as the private sector could be in delivering the same services. In economics, we are taught that efficiency is reached when the social marginal benefit of allocating resources in a particular direction equals the social marginal cost. And many times, state-owned enterprises do not have the system of incentives to be reaching that efficiency frontier. The third point I want to mention about why SOEs, the choices are constrained in developing countries is they often impede competition. They impede competition through barriers to entry, through unfair competitive practice, and through other areas. And this can stifle innovation. And this is probably, in my view, the most negative consequence of having an inefficient state-owned enterprise sector because it prevents new entrants into industry, particularly young people who may have ideas for innovation and how they can better provide the same goods or services that an SOE may be providing. And lastly, the very important point about strengthening service delivery. In many countries, um, state-owned enterprises may not be the most efficient in terms of addressing the citizens' needs. I can give an example from Pakistan, for instance, where there is a big problem with the electricity bills and the country is once again having to deal with the burden of a very sharp increase in electricity bills. Well, there is a lot of theft of electricity in Pakistan. And this theft is a lot more in those distribution utilities that are owned by the state rather than the private sector. And when you have electricity theft, and that something is not being done about it, then essentially what you have is a system where the honest bill payers, those who are paying their bills in full and on time, are effectively and de facto subsidizing those who are stealing electricity. And that is not fair to those who are paying their bills. And typically what you find is that under private ownership, theft is reduced um, because Efficiency is a far greater metric upon which the private sector operates. So in summary, the point that I wanted to make was about, you know, in general countries around the world, particularly in the West, have various forms of the role of the state. In developing countries and emerging markets, I think these choices are a lot more constrained where there are problems of foreign exchange and debt. And we need to take a much narrower view for where SOE's presence isn't really needed. But I want to end on a caveat, and that's an important caveat, which is that state-owned enterprise reform should not be taken to mean that the goal is to change public monopolies to private monopolies. If SOE reform ends up just creating private monopolies, then it may not be achieving the benefits that one wants from state-owned enterprise reform, and one needs very good and adequate regulation to then ensure that the citizens are being well protected in terms of both the price and the quality of the services that are being delivered to them. So let me stop on those notes and once again, thank everybody for joining uh, to hear some of the points that I had to share both on debt restructuring and also on state-owned enterprise reform. Thank you, Dr. Bakir. Um, we'll take a couple of questions for each panelist before we open up to audience questions. Um, so if I can if I can go to you, Dr. Kumaraswamy, um, you mentioned uh, about setting up a, a debt office so that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka doesn't have uh, uh, conflicts of interest in, in their responsibilities. Uh, the governor this morning also mentioned that uh, uh, access to markets, the, the, he doesn't expect access to markets until 2027. Given that we are a country that has been financing our fiscal deficit about 50% uh, foreign to 50% local, uh, how do you think that the uh, uh, lack of market access or that we are not going to access 
commercial markets till 2027 uh, is going to change the debt dynamics in the country. Okay, thank you very much. Let me also thank uh, Dr. Reza very much before I start on responding to you um, for those really valuable uh, remarks that he made. I think it draws on his uh, highly distinguished uh, professional uh, expertise in both Pakistan and the IMF, and I think those are you know very well uh, taken points. Um, may I also make one point, you know, because I, I rushed at the end uh, to finish because of my, I had run over on my time. One thing I wanted to say as to why I said the next crisis will be worse than anything we've had before, because we will go into the next crisis with a far lower level of resilience, both in the economy and among the people, right? So the next time around, the impact is going to be much more painful. That's why I said that this is going to be worse than anything we've had before. Um, because the present mul uh, multiple crisis has had such a devastating impact that uh, we'll be at a much, much lower level of resilience going into the next one. So we need to make sure we never allow that to happen. And in, for to uh, ensure that, two things. Primary surplus in the budget, as Dr. Raza said, you don't want the debt stock to keep increasing. Primary surplus in the budget, one. Second thing is export transformation. More diversified um, uh, export basket and a more complex set of products in that basket and also diversification of markets. Those two things will take us out if we are able to do it well, take us out of this twin deficit category that we're stuck in or have been stuck in for many years. Sorry, okay. To respond to your question, um, the um, certainly until we regain market access, um, one thing is on the external side, I think we are likely to get more official assistance. If you remember Sri Lanka, when it was the low-income countries, was what they called the donor darling. We were the second country after Chile to liberalize our economy way back in 1977. The traditional donors wanted to demonstrate good outcomes in a country with a liberal polity and a liberal economy, and we got lots of money. Then we graduated, we lost access to official money to a large extent. Now, that those envelopes are increasing. The fund um, is going to have this EFF, but then more pertinently, the World Bank and the ADB have also kind of upscaled their support for Sri Lanka. And Japan, which was our number one donor for many years, if we are able to get through a debt restructuring, reading what has been coming out uh, from the president and from others, Japan would be ready to step in in a major way as well. And, you know, and India, China, there will be other official sources. Uh, and we need to shift from borrowing to equity. That's the other thing, you know, we, in, in terms of, um, you know, our FDI performance has been appalling, quite frankly, if we're honest. So that's where we have a dish, pivot from um, lending to equity and an increase in official funding should see us through. Uh, till we're able to regain market access in 27 or beyond. And the, if we don't, if we are not able to give it enough confidence to external uh, uh, providers of capital, um, we will have to raise the money domestically, which will mean that we'll have extremely high interest rates. We'll have crowding out, and the mechanism that the crowding out will take place is through the, the, through the interest rates. If we have to raise all the money or much more of the money the government needs domestically, that will have an impact on interest rates. And it will make, make it more difficult for the private sector to get capital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Swami. Uh, Dr. Bakir, if I may now come to you, uh, you spoke a little bit about SOA restructuring. Um, could you comment on how Sri Lanka has been performing on this front and the progress made so far, uh, specifically in the context of Sri Lanka? and? Uh, in terms of uh, potential pitfalls, uh, do you think we are uh, our timeline is realistic and that we, we are making good progress so far on the restructuring? So let me begin by saying that SOE restructuring reform, the restructure is never easy. And it's never easy because when you have um, industries or enterprises that have been operating in a particular way, uh, 
for a number of years, they have created their own ecosystem of how things are being done. And then reform in this area really means that you are going to be changing the way things are done. So people have to adjust and that takes time. It is important to take the time to get all the stakeholders on board so that there is the ownership in the actual changes that will occur. I see a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the outlook for SOE reform in Sri Lanka and particularly in sectors where uh, the Sri Lankan government will be going to the international market to find potential investors. And international investors first begin from the overall macro story. They first begin to see if a country is in default, how is it doing in terms of its progress towards getting out of default and concluding a deal with its creditors. And I think there, as Dr. Indraji mentioned, and also as the governor mentioned earlier this morning, there are good grounds to be optimistic about it because progress is being made. You know, several months ago, people were all talking about whether the needed financing assurances would come from all the official creditors. Some had given earlier than others, but they all came and the board meeting happened. And a fund mission is coming, as I understand it, to Sri Lanka as well. So the first thing is maintaining this progress at the level of the progress on debt restructuring, on which, as I mentioned, good grounds to be optimistic. That sets the color, the prism, or the lens through which international investors look at potential opportunities in a country. I think the second is uh, organizing the process within the country regarding state-owned enterprise reform. In my view, there is being good progress that is being made. Um, and I think it has also been very helpful that there is consultation with the relevant stakeholders so that there is ownership. And one thing I can say from my experience in other countries is that communication around the goals of state-owned enterprise reform to all the stakeholders, whether it is the employees of the organizations, whether it is the public in, at large, whether it is stakeholders in the government, is a very important part of that process. And um, if it means repeating some of the messages that is also helpful because you are really endeavoring to change a mindset. But it's important to take everybody along and that helps to generate ownership and to ensure that once those divestiture reforms are done, that they will deliver on the intended benefits that, uh, that were envisioned. If I may, I just wanted to maybe add one more comment to what Dr. Inderjeet was saying, because he mentioned about some very critical areas, such as stopping the financing of the deficit from the central bank, absolutely critical. Then he mentioned some other areas as well. And I wanted to bring these out because, you know, there is a lesson from the recent history of debt restructurings, which is um, in the 80s, the then developing countries got big debt relief through the form of HIPIC and MDRI, right? If you start the clock then and you trace these countries, you will see that after HIPIC, a number of countries managed to keep their debt to GDP burdens low. But there are some countries that were not as successful and some of the HIPIC recipients now are facing very, very significant debt burdens. If you look at the World Bank's categorization of a number of countries in high risk of debt distress, or let's say even medium, or that are in debt distress, you know, a number of them are HIPIC recipients. And I wanted to just underscore the point Dr. Indrajit made that then sticking to those structural reforms and having good communication to people and to voters around that is very important that we want to make sure, yes, Sri Lanka had to go through a painful, difficult experience, but this is the last time it happens and going forward, it is not going to have the same experience as some other countries are right now that previously benefited from debt relief. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakir. Uh, we have time for some audience questions. So I'm going to group some questions to, uh, together and pose them to the panelists. Uh, so Dr. Kumar Swami, there's one question on, uh, is there any update on the progress with the uh, Chinese debt restructuring and online PFM platform? And a second question to you also regarding the foreign banks in Sri Lanka, uh, not lending, but uh, investing money in the SLF, if you have uh, any comment on that. Sorry, and investing in government securities, is it? Is that what you're saying? Uh, in the overnight window in the SLF. In the overnight window, sorry, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, so on the um, Chinese debt restructuring, um, you know, this is very much an outsider's view. Obviously, I'm not uh, no longer directly involved uh, in what is going on. Uh, as you know, um, China is negotiating separately. It's negotiating directly with the government. It is not on the same platform as the Paris Club, India, Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc. Um, my understanding is, and I think the governor repeated this, repeated it this morning. The Chinese have been speaking regularly to the authorities, um, and uh, there is, of course, the Exim Bank debt, which is official debt, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, there has been good contact and communication with the Exim Bank, to the best of my knowledge. And then we have the CDB debt, the China Development Bank debt, which is which is commercial debt. Um, the governor this morning again expressed optimism that things are moving in the right direction. Uh, the important thing is uh, for all the parties to be talking, and that is happening. And then we are also having high-level exchanges in terms of visits um, of senior uh, political figures from the two countries uh, to each each other's country. So all these things seem to provide a fairly positive background uh, to what, uh, what uh, hopefully will transpire in the coming weeks. Uh, clearly, there has to be compatibility between what is negotiated bilaterally with China and what is negotiated uh, with the platform uh, of countries uh, no, Paris Club and non-Paris Club. So I would say, yeah, there is grounds for optimism. Uh, secondly, on foreign banks, um, the reason, a couple of things. So the demand for credit has been very low, uh, simply because of the problems related to sentiment and confidence. And with the economy contracting by what, 8% last year and 11 point something percent in the first quarter of this year. Uh, but that's turning around. And the pro probability, balance of probability is that in the fourth quarter, we will see positive growth. And as the economy picks up momentum, and as we move forward on the uh, uh, debt restructuring and the IMF program, sentiment and confidence will improve both domestically and amongst ex external uh, players. And all that I think will mean that the, uh, the economic activity will increase and the opportunities for lending will increase for banks and uh, they will then allocate more uh, of, of their uh, uh, financing to uh, economic activity, supporting economic activity. Um, also, the, the central bank is likely to reduce its policy rates further. I think the governor indicated there was scope for that. So the the, the push factor will also be there as those interest rates come down uh, and as economic activity gathers momentum on the other. Both those uh, trends uh, taken together, I think, uh, should see the banks um, increasing their uh, exposure to private sector economic activity. Thank you. Um, let me group the next couple of questions uh, to Dr. Bakir. Uh, so there's one question. Uh, uh, what do you think, how, how effective do you think the IMF is? Um, their programs are at monitoring and evaluation, since most of the governments that go through IMF programs roll back the changes eventually. Uh, and a second question about can you can you share some general numbers or insights on some of the countries that are currently going through debt restructuring and some of the common pitfalls uh, and risks that they face? Sure. So on the first question on the IMF, um, I think one should begin by appreciating the manner in which the IMF helps countries. Uh, often the debate around IMF, particularly in developing countries that have been frequent borrowers of the IMF, 
goes immediately into a criticism of the IMF, but it's important first to just take a step back and recognize that as members of the IMF, and particularly those members who have repeatedly drawn on IMF resources, there are some critical uh, benefits that such membership provides as a lender of last resort. I think it is a matter of fact that in the COVID crisis, amongst all the international financial institutions, the IMF was the fastest to move and the institution that gave the largest amount of uh, economic assistance through RFI is a rapid finance instruments. And I remember Pakistan at that time was also one of the uh, recipients of that assistance as well. So I think just the point I want to mention is that as a lender of last resort, I think we should not forget that when a country is in debt distress and the finance minister or a central bank governor of a country has to make a call when things are looking very, very bleak, that there is somebody on the other end of the telephone line to answer that call. And, you know, in, that may not be the case. The IMF is created for that purpose. Let us appreciate that before we come on to some areas where the IMF could do better what it's doing. I think the first area where it could do better is around communication and ownership. Yes, uh, the citizens of a number of such countries have serious misgivings about uh, the role of the IMF. Yes, there is part of it that stems from the fact that often policymakers in these countries often themselves are critical of uh, onerous IMF conditions. But I think there is a part of it and uh, ownership of it that uh, rests with the IMF as well in terms of being able to more effectively communicate, do outreach and help to change opinions. If indeed it is providing um, a service to the international financial community and the architecture, it is in its interest to be able to communicate that better with examples so that it overcomes the suspicions that people naturally have. So I think my first suggestion is taking greater ownership on the part of the IMF to improve its public perception. My second point is another area where I think the IMF can, can also do better. It tries, but there is scope, is its ability to generate traction on the structural reform agenda. So IMF um, staff and economists, and I say this partly as experience, are very good, very, very good at measuring fiscal deficit outcomes, foreign exchange reserve outcomes, monetary policy, interest rate decisions, uh, net domestic assets developments, and down to two decimal places and down to the you know, small impact of various tax measures. Very good, very good expertise. But, you know, these are all sort of fairly narrowly defined macroeconomic um, uh, targets of program conditionality. The reason why a number of these countries are in trouble is because of the lack of progress on structural reforms. And these structural reform comes in a whole variety of areas. Look at, say, electricity sector issues or energy sector issues. In, uh, in other countries, look at the role of um, state-owned enterprises in a whole host of sectors. Uh, in other countries, it's institutional matters such as governance. Uh, in other countries, even um, you know, central bank independence, the relationship between de jure and de facto independence. Uh, is it sufficient to just change the law? Or there are certain de facto considerations that need to be looked at as well. In my experience, what ends up happening is that when there is pressure to conclude a review, the attention naturally focuses on the quantitative targets, the macro targets, figuring out is there a hole, if there is a gap, what are credible and specific measures that can address that so that staff can take a review to the board. The structural agenda sometimes gets crowded out, and I think greater attention to, first of all, understanding the issues better and also thinking of how the reforms can be done so that they gain traction. That's an area where I think it, uh, you know, the IMF can usefully make more investment and will get returns. Maybe it's not for the IMF, and therefore what is needed is greater 
collaboration with entities like the World Bank or even other entities that have been working on the structural reform agenda. So in summary, you know, just three points. One, let's not forget to appreciate the benefits that, you know, there is somebody on the other end of the phone call when a minister of finance or a central bank governor calls. That's the role of the IMF. It has been doing that. I think number two, maybe um, the IMF needs to put its own resources in improving its image, particularly in those countries where it gets a bad rap. And third, that I think the IMF needs to somehow train its economists more and change its way of operating in a direction to give greater attention to the ownership and longevity of structural reforms in the countries that it is lending to. Because that is as much a, that's a joint failure when, when structural reforms have not taken uh, been undertaken in countries where the IMF has repeatedly lent. It's a joint failure, both on the part of the country and also on the part of the IMF. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakir. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Uh, so let me just take some time to thank both our panelists. Um, they very kindly accepted our invitation and took time off their busy schedules to shed some light on some very important topics for the country. So uh, on behalf of Cal, let me thank the both of you for, for joining us today. Uh, let me also thank our audience for joining us. Please do join us tomorrow as well at 1 p.m. Uh, for our panel discussion on asset allocation in a post-crisis landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.